It's easy to hear your favorite artist on WFPK from wherever you are. Listen on your smart speaker, live stream from our website at WFPK.org, from Louisville Public Media. Consequence Podcast Network. And welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org, Consequence of Sound, and the Consequence Podcast Network. want to thank you for checking out the episode. want to thank everybody who uh, especially listens uh, throughout the week, subscribes to the series. You can do so at uh, iTunes and Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube. Hopefully you'll hit that subscribe button because if you do... We'll deliver brand new interviews to you every single week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so you can keep up with your favorite artists and discover new ones. Know what's happening in the music world. Kyle Meredith with wherever you get podcasts from. I'm Kyle Meredith. Today I'm going to be talking with Steve Earle. He's back with a brand new record called The Ghosts of West Virginia, and it's a very timely record. First of all, it carries ties to a to a documentary musical that was premiering up in New York before the uh, pandemic started uh, called Cold Country about coal miners in West Virginia. And it's all based on uh, true stories. In fact, uh, as far as the musical goes, uh, everything that you hear in that is from actual interviews that they've done with these coal miners in West Virginia. For Steve Earle, it's that and some other stuff. He wanted to make a record for people that don't vote the same way he does. Uh, He is an outspoken liberal. Uh, This was sort of meant to talk to another part of the country, and he's going to tell you all about that, uh, as well as telling the stories of those involved in the mining accidents and just growing up in mining and the importance of unions and all this. Uh, he said unions being the common ground uh, sort of between the two sides. Now, of course, you have to take something like this and then make it musical. Steve will also talk in depth about that and why ghosts is such a useful writing tool. He makes ghosts very poetic. He's written books using ghosts, songs using ghosts. He'll talk about growing up with ghost stories and some of his favorite movies as well. So let's get into it. It's Kyle Meredith. With Steve Earle. I'm good. I mean, you know, considering I'm, I'm in the same position pretty much everybody else is. I'm not going very many places. And, you know, I go to drop John Henry off at his mom's and I run to the grocery store. And I've seen my mom once because she's, you know, in her 80s and already on oxygen. And I saw her from across the room wearing a mask. So oh. normally I would be at her place a lot with you know being in Tennessee for this long but but right. you know, that's not the way it is at the moment so I'm supposed to be rehearsing for a tour right now first day of rehearsal should have been today you know so I would have been here by this time but I've been here since March 18th and um, I haven't this is the I spent more time at the house in Tennessee in the last you know since March 18th than I have in the last two years put together <laughs> We're actually that's four years five years wow together, probably well, that's just right up the road you know I, I'm here in Louisville and, and sort of the same thing working out of my closet it's it's amazing uh, just how much talk time I've gotten o- over a microphone to people that I've, I'll, I I don't see. You know, right. It's, uh, right. <laughs> right. You know, but but here we are. You, you, either way around it, you, you've still got this record, uh, Goes to West Virginia, which let me throw the compliments to you. It is such a powerful piece of work that you've done. As we read the story goes, this is tied to a play called Cold Country, which was supposed to have opened. Did, did you guys ever actually get to do any performances of this? Oh yeah, twenty six. We, we we did two weeks of previews and we were open for a week. The reviews were great, and then the second week we, you know, Mondays dark in theater in New York. You don't work on Mondays, and Tuesday night we did the show, and then um, the word came out that Broadway was closing that night, and the next day we co- got called to a meeting at the Public on the thirteenth, and we went in and we did not go up that night. So. Wow. The last time that we performed it was was March 12th. You know, it, it was a hit. It was like people were buying tickets and the reviews were great. And then we got the plug pulled by, by COVID-19. It, it's interesting because, you know, the play, you all are doing this in New York. The play's about West Virginia and, and the coal mines, which I'm definitely going to get into a lot uh, here in just a second. The audience that you were talking to at the time, did you find that these were people that had connections to it or were they, you know, curiosity seekers? Like, did, could you tell the, exactly who you were singing to those nights? You could tell some. I mean, we we had the odd person in a West Virginia T-shirt. It was funny. People from West Virginia are incredibly proud. And, um, you know, it's not just football. They're, they're really into that. But they they um, – they like uh, coal mining is people that that are willing to go three miles underground is where this explosion happened. The guys that that were working on that long wall, that big machine, that that continuous miner, the machines technically called those guys 
is we're right an hour and a half. Now think about that on, on, on the man trip, it's a little train, mm -hmm. but it took an hour and a half to get to where they were actually working. Th think about being an hour and a half, three miles under a mountain. And I couldn't do it. And, and there's a lot of people that are born and raised in West Virginia, third generation, fourth generation coal families that can't do it. And so it's a matter of some pride. They, they have that, take a lot of pride in this is steel making coal that, that they, you know, that that part of the country takes a lot of pride in. They mine the coal that made the steel that built America. And, you know, one World War II and, and you know, a lot of other things. It just goes back to uh, I was just looking for a way before I got the call about coal country to make a record that maybe spoke to and for people that didn't vote the way that I did, because I think concentrating on what we don't have in common is, is what's killing us right now. And the mm -hmm. truth is most people have more in common with people that live in another part of the world and live differently than they do than they, than, than we think they do. And there's people that are profiting from keeping us divided. And I really truly believe that. And then Jessica Blank and Eric, Jensen called me. They made a, a piece of documentary theater, they call it, because it's based on interviews and every word comes from the people that, you know, the story's about. Um, years ago called The Exonerated, and it was about death row exonerees. And I worked around that issue. So I met them then. I was involved in it as an actor. And they wanted to do a piece about the Upper Big Branch explosion in, in Montco, West Virginia. And it was just perfect. That's the, the, it was the perfect, you know, that whole idea of areas of the country where people made their living. The only people that, that were making a decent living were people that were involved in taking coal out of the ground. And then of course, there's lots of people in West Virginia that don't have jobs in coal. And that's a whole nother story. So I just, we went to the public theater, they commissioned it and we traveled to West Virginia. The, they conducted the interviews. I just met the folks and started writing songs. And um, I just decided to extrapolate it into a full 10 cut record. There's seven songs on the record that were actually in coal country and the rest of them I wrote either during the process or later to round the record up. And we recorded it in December at Electric Lady in New York and coal country went up in January. And the plan was we would have been closing about right now and I'd have been <laughs> rehearsing for a tour and continue to go out to tell these people's story. Cause that's the important part to me mm -hmm. is that these folks talk to us because they wanted to. They talked to us because they wanted their story and the story of their loved ones. 29 guys died that day mm -hmm. and uh, they wanted their stories told and that's the whole point of this exercise. Going back to what you said early on in that too, you know, wanting to do a political record that talked to the other side, you know, close the divide, maybe as the cliche goes. What what does that mean for you when you're when you are telling these stories? Like is there ever a moment that you use songwriting to say things that you might not personally regularly say? Yeah, I've done it a lot. I mean, this is not I'm I don't believe anything that John Walker Lim says and 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 you know, John Walker's blues. I'm, I'm, that's a character. It's not John Walker Lind. It's a, in fairness, it's a character based on my idea of John Walker Lind talking to you in that song. I don't think the same way as the person is singing to you in Copperhead Road. That's a very political record, Copperhead Road. And it was based on my post Vietnam experience as someone that didn't go and someone that always opposed the war. But by that time, I'd managed to process the idea that, that, hey, there were people standing out there, you know, yelling baby killer and spitting on guys that went to Vietnam and fought simply because they were, they were working class. They had no choice but to go. Not everybody has it in them to run away and go to Canada. And I don't judge people for doing that. I had friends that did it, some of my closest friends, and I totally got that. And I thought those people were incredibly brave. But most people live their whole lives within an hour and a half of where they were born. And we're not, you know, that much different than a lot of wild life when it comes to that not not most it's always important to remember everybody's experience isn't the same as yours and and when you especially when you've been as fortunate as i've been i have to remind myself that that i'm the way that i, I am largely because of privilege i've been really lucky enough to make a living doing something that i really love doing and it doesn't work out that way for a lot of people and probably for most people most people go to work and they work at a job hopefully they don't hate it and they take care of their families and that's where their politics are rooted and and that's you know that's why the only politics in this record 
or about unions when it comes right down to it, because I thought that might be the common ground between some people in New York and some people in West Virginia. And that's what it, it's this is chess. It's not checkers. It's the beginning of of a conversation about what we have in common rather than how we're different. So so with that in mind, then. What's the outcome that you're hoping for here? Because, you know, obviously you don't go into this saying, I'm totally going to change your mind to vote for this other party. But, you know, and and I'll bring this back, you know, to me locally here too, because I'm in Kentucky, I'm in Louisville. We have Mitch McConnell that, you know, I'm personally not proud to be representing me and everything. I Nor would should love, you be. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so I want to talk to people and say, quit voting against yourself, you know, listen to what's actually being said. But, but is that the angle that you also take when you're writing a record like this with them well, in mind? I think, I think if you, I think if just saying, Hey, you're voting against your interests, you know, uh, and what's the next sentence going to be? Well, for me, from an intellectual standpoint, I could go, well, capitalism is fundamentally oppressive because it depends on a surplus of labor to strive and I'm a, to thrive, and I'm going to lose them right there at that point. And that's true. It's from Das Kapital, <laughs> and it's but it's still rhetoric, even though it's true and it's theory. It's it's a form of political math. And the truth is, most people aren't sitting around talking about politics the way we are. They're getting up and going to work and they're getting a paycheck and then they're going to the grocery and that's where their political ideas get formed. And the deal with in any part of the country where the only thing working people, you know, have any shot at, at really like making their lives better it is dangerous. Most of those jobs have gone away and, and there's not that many. Um, the, the difference between West Virginia and Eastern Kentucky, for instance, is that coal, m- there was some coal still in West Virginia that was that was high quality steel making coal. So it made the union hang on for a little bit longer in West Virginia than it was able to in Eastern Kentucky. And that's a different part of the history. And so right now, I can go in and, and and all I can do is convince people in West Virginia that I hear them, that I get it to a certain degree, that I, I, I don't have any trouble understanding why people in West Virginia voted for Donald Trump. Hillary Clinton went there and said, I'm going to close the coal mines down. Ten days later, Donald Trump said he wouldn't. And that's it. That's simple. And to judge people for that is just that we're, we're dead in the water right at that point when you start thinking you know jessica blank who wrote the the script she and her husband eric jensen wrote the script for for coal country she says something i think is pretty profound is that the last acceptable prejudice in the united states of america is thinking that you're better than somebody that lives in a place like west virginia or mississippi or eastern kentucky because for whatever reasons. In other words, a prejudice against against people they see as being rednecks. And and the truth is what we have in common, it, it, like maybe lefties in New York City or, or LA or wherever is, when, when you start talking about unions, there's, there's, some, there's a common ground because the truth is the unions didn't get away you know, it's pretty. That happened pretty recently in West Virginia, and people uh, people remember it, and they remember they do remember that things were were way, way, way better when there were unions in all of those mines. And we've got a guy who votes against them, and people still vote for him anyway. But I will digress from that just yeah. a second because I do want to bring this to the to specifically, you know, what's going on in this record? Because at some point you have to take all of this, you know, as you said, ninety five percent of the script of the play came from interviews, and you're hearing these, and you have to make it musical, like compliments on, you know, it's about blood. You're saying a lot. And, and I mean, lyrically, you're saying a lot in that there's a lot of words. There's a lot of story to tell. Yep. What challenge of taking all of that? Because it's one challenge to make it a play, sure. But what's the challenge to take all that and make it these songs? Well, I, it was actually easier for me to do my job than it was for Jessica to do hers because Chess was bound by the rules of documentary theater. When you call it documentary theater, then you're not allowed to make any words up and put any words in anybody's mouth. You can rearrange them a little bit at best. I wasn't handcuffed by that. Now, that being said, because I was trying to tell these people's story, it's about blood. The whole first verse comes out of, is inspired by um, one of the characters in the play and a real person. His name's Tommy Davis. And Tommy would just happened to be the most vocal of the, the, Tommy lost his son, his brother, 
doctor and his nephew that day. And he and, and another nephew, you know, were there and working, but, but they survived because they were closer to the surface. Mm -hmm. So he, he was really, really angry. Therefore, he was the one that you saw on the, that you saw on the Today Show, you know, right after this happened. That was time, if you go back and look at those, those stories, you'll find Tommy Davis really quickly if you start Googling the news stories around Upper Big Branch. And that whole first verse is just Tommy, rage and that's what inspired it and and uh i just um kind of went from there i put a lot of the rhetoric in that song a lot of the political ideas and the economic ideas you know um are in that because because they're they're his perspective of it and other people's perspective these were smart people you know i didn't meet anybody stupid in, in this trip any of these trips to west virginia i didn't meet one single stupid person and that's the thing so in law, if we keep thinking that everybody that voted for donald trump is a racist and everybody that voted for donald trump is stupid then then we are in serious serious trouble because it's simply not true and the same thing will happen this time that happened last time if we start keep thinking that way so, so was it uh, musically did it did it make it pretty obvious that folk was sort of the way to go you know i listened to john henry who's a still drive a man i hear very classic folk in that even with the first single devil devil put the coal in the ground you know might be a, a new song but i can hear pete Seeger. i can hear woody guthrie in that you know yeah the but the of... the record also rocks and and i think sure. it has as much to do it's about blood you know like probably rocks the hardest but which is that song that you know tommy davis started out with and you know, it's just the idea of it's def what I do is folk music. There's not any doubt about that. I don't apologize about that. But but we, you know, this rocks pretty hard and, and, and it was on purpose. I didn't want to make it like sound like a Pete Seeger record or a Woody Guthrie record because I wanted, because was not lost on me. One of the reasons I'm getting a chance to tell the story and one reason people talk to me and one reason people trusted me is because number one, I talk like this. And number two, I, I wrote Copperhead Road. So there's a belief that every one of them has owned it at one time or another. And there's stuff in that song that tells you that I know something about that part of the country, you know, because some of that is things that I, I knew, not things that I made up. So, I mean, I made up the character, but it was based on people and things that I knew. So that gave, it gave, it gave me an end to be able to do this, but it also made me feel like I have, because I, we have that language in common that I have a responsibility to make this record. Well, I'll wrap up with this one too, because I want to tie this back to another project of yours um, with uh, the Lost Highway. And using ghosts as a way to tell a story, obviously the name of this record is Ghosts of West Virginia. You've used uh, the ghost of Hank Williams, and by the way, one of my favorite books that I've ever read. Uh, I want to use this moment to <laughs> compliment you there as well. I don't think I've ever, ever been able to, but- uh, Thanks, appreciate what's, it. Yeah, what uh, is there? Is there a reason why you know, at least in these couple of instances, you've used that specifically? And I'll say that again: a ghost as a way to push a, a story. I, I like the idea of ghosts poetically, and I like the the, the I, I you know I, a lot of that's probably growing up with, you know, some of my favorite movies growing up were were the better. They, we used to have a different kind of horror movie than we have now. Mm -hmm. It wasn't about cutting people up, but it wasn't about things being gross on screen. You know, movies like uh, um, the, the original version of The Haunting, uh, The Haunting of Hill House is, you know, is, is, is what it was based on, mm -hmm. and The Uninvited. And, you know, ghost stories that were, they were kind of like just the kind of ghost stories that people used to tell around campfires. And they were about, they were about, you know, um, they were about mystery and, um, you know, I just sort of, as a writer, I've always just sort of been romantically attracted to that stuff. And I grew up on ghost stories. And then when I was younger than that, Dracula and Frankenstein, and, you know, all those movies playing on, that were made long before I was born playing on TV when I was growing up. So, so I like the idea of a, something a little, little supernatural. I also, there's only a few authors that I possess everything they ever wrote. I have everything Ernest Hemingway and Graham Greene ever wrote. I have everything Mark Twain ever wrote, but I also have everything that J.K. Rowling ever wrote and William Shakespeare. And there's a lot of ghosts in Shakespeare too. Uh, I love the way you write, Steve. And uh, it's again, such a powerful listen, this record with Ghosts of West Virginia. Thank you for tackling this. It does hit, you know, we may be in Louisville, but it's still close to home here in Kentucky. And I think it's important stuff that you're doing out there that you've always been doing. So thank you for the music. And, and thank you for the conversation today. And we'll see you next summer, I promise. And my thanks, Mr. Steve Earl, Ghosts of West Virginia is the brand new record. It is an absolutely great piece of art. Do check it out. Thanks to you 
for listening to this episode, too. Uh, before you get out of here, I do hope if you're not a subscriber, you will hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of the interviews that we put out every single week. New ones every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at iTunes and Apple Podcasts, at Spotify, at YouTube, wherever you like to get your podcasts from. Just hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with your favorite artists and learn about new ones and know what's happening in the music world. After that, head to WFPK.org. That's where I do a show Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern, an hour full of song premieres and music news, anniversary spins, and bonus interviews. Again, that's WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound, they've got your music and film news. You can find me on social media, uh, most of the spots at Kyle Meredith. Hopefully you'll follow and like along there as well. And that does it for another edition. I'm Kyle Meredith. I'll see you next time. Consequence Podcast Network. Do you read Stephen King? Good news. There's a club for you. The Losers Club. Every Friday, us losers journey through the never-ending wastelands of King's Dominion. We sink our teeth into each of King's novels, dive deep into the lore, and review every adaptation. Even better, we're always having guests over. Thomas Jane, Will Wheaton, Mary Lambert, Mick Garris, the list goes on. So what are you waiting for? Join us as we read on through long days and pleasant nights.